Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I understand this noise is due to the fact that we don't have enough seats. Um, sorry for that, but I have a duty to, to ask you to be seated, and uh, we are about to open the Riga conference. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to Riga conference. One year has passed, and much has changed in international affairs, and not everything to good. I think this is a reason for meeting again and uh, benchmarking where we are, what we can do better, what are our objectives. And uh, this year we have uh, two days of exciting panels. We have excellent experts, colleagues. And with this short introduction, I would like to welcome the President of the uh, Republic of Latvia, Raimonds Vejonis, to say a few introductory words. Mr. President, the floor is yours, please. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you to the 2017 Riga Conference. We live in a time of change and uncertainty. The comfortable and relatively safe world that Europe had come to know since the fall of the Baltic Wall, Berlin Wall, sorry, but also, it's <laughs> we had a wall around, uh, has gone. Instead, we are faced with a host of new challenges. This range from severe financial crisis and unpopular austerity to international terrorism and refugees. Our democratic institutions are under attack in the modern information space, and our infrastructure is under cyber attack. It is no surprise that reactions differ from country to country, as well as on different sides of the Atlantic. The result of last year's UK referendum and the outcome of the US presidential election were unexpected and have made us reassess all certainties. It has also focused our minds on what we can do to improve our security. Since I became president two years ago, security has been my priority. We are used to hearing about hard and soft power and about resilience. Napoleon wrote that the moral is to the physical as three is to one. Therefore, I would like to look at security in two ways, as, as soft security and hard security. Hard security is in many ways the easier part for Europe, this has been based primarily on the NATO alliance with North America, Atlanticism. Latvia was indeed fortunate to be able to join the alliance in 2004. Following the Russian occupation and annexation of Crimea and intervention in the Donbas, membership has reassured us and provided an unprecedented degree of deterrence for our region. Our NATO allies have shown an understanding of the situation in which we find ourselves. The historic Warsaw Summit, with its commitment to enhanced forward presence, is crucial for our hard security. And we are most grateful to the contributing nations participating in the Canadian-led battle group in Latvia. It is also important to recognize the unique role that America plays 
in the alliance. America's commitment to Article 5 has again been confirmed. The U.S. battalion in Poland is excellent, but I would like to stress that a continuing U.S. footprint in the Baltic states is also essential if we are to send the right signals about our determination to deter and defend. If NATO helps us overcome the challenges of hard security, the EU should do the same with soft security. As Europeans, we must do more to protect our borders and our citizens. Areas of greater cooperation include the safety of our information space and cyber security. We must stimulate media literacy and critical thinking in our populations. Latvia and the other Baltic countries have always been and always will be European despite 50 years of Soviet occupation. We want to be at core of Europe, not in some gray zone. Our vision is of a Europe with no division lines and without large differences between individual member states. The key is to be part of active Europe. Instead of complaining about the dangers of a two-speed Europe. For Latvia, hard security has meant a steep rise in military expenditure, which will reach 2% of GDP in January, improved equipment programs, and a significant boost to our national guard. The Zemesarde. Latvia must continue to contribute to NATO and the EU in areas where we have particular expertise, such as joint terminal attack controllers, special forces, and other niche capabilities. Our Stratcom Center of Excellence has very quickly become a worldwide authority on the subject. However, we must also recognize the different priorities of soft security. In order to counter hybrid threats, trust and belief in the state are central. Soft security involves everyone, not just military and state personnel. Therefore, we must look after all our citizens as well we can. Two-person defense spending must be balanced with other programs, such as adequate health care and good quality education. Even more, social cohesion among ethnic groups is vitally important. Even small symbolic opportunities to remove barriers must be seized. Ladies and gentlemen, I have talked about soft and hard security, but to conclude, I want to mention our shared values, life, liberty, equality, and democracy. I think it would be fair to call these the values that the vast majority of Americans and Europeans still hold now. Let us be clear, today, they are under attack. Therefore, we must do all we can in, in areas of both soft and hard security to ensure that our children and grandchildren will be able to exercise these rights in the future. I hope that the exchange of ideas at this conference will result in the development of goals for the future. Thank you for attention.
Thank you, Mr. President, for your opening remarks. Um, with this, um, I'm very honored to welcome you here. I represent the organizing committee of League Conference. My name is Toms Baumanis, and it also needs to be mentioned that President uh, was, um, had to go for another meeting with uh, Ukrainian Foreign Minister. Now, we have first distinguished panel, and I would like to invite uh, all panelists on the stage uh, Minister of Defense of Latvia, Raymond Bergmanis, Minister of Defense of Canada, Hajit Singh, Paolo Alti, Ali from uh, Italy, Parla President of NATO Parliamentary Assembly, Hans Benedik, Claudia Mayer from German Institute of International Affairs, and moderator today is Janeta Uzolin, a professor, vice chair of uh, Latvian Transatlantic Organization. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to start. Uh, before we proceed directly to our discussions, uh, I have some administrative business to do. Uh, so organizers uh, <coughs> encouraged me to uh, remind that uh, there is a online possibility to follow our conference, uh, www.rigaconference.lv, as well as those who would like to participate more actively and ask questions to provide also some comments can uh, use Twitter. Uh, which is uh, RigaConf uh, 17. So it means that uh, the number of participants are not strictly defined with the number of people here in this room, but we have much wider conference uh, participants. So it's time to start. Uh, the team of our panelists uh, was introduced, so I, I uh, have, have this possibility slightly to uh, save our time. Uh, but the title of our panel is July 2018, uh, Brussels uh, NATO leaders agree on. And we are now in a very interesting times in terms of uh, very successful and very active NATO's presence uh, in its eastern and southern flank where threats are obvious and a lot of capabilities and actions are needed in these areas. And also our president mentions that Baltic states can be uh, very, uh, very secure at the present moment with support of uh, uh, multinational forces. But at the same time, the business is not over yet. Uh, it's very much on its way. So uh, therefore, it's uh, time really to approach issues of uh, international security, which uh, security leaders of NATO member states will debate uh, in uh, Brussels uh, in a relatively short period of time. So therefore, I would like to invite the Minister of Defense of Latvia, Mr. Zbergmans. So what would be your list of uh, issues, priorities, which should be debated in the next summit. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm delighted uh, the privilege uh, to be the first uh, speakers in this uh, honorable audience. But the panel's topics expect to me predict uh, what NATO leaders will be able to agree upon in July 2018. Uh, that would be an easy task if I had a crystal ball. Long-standing uh, false sense of security gave us a rude awakening when Ukraine was invaded. Prior to that, many viewed our neighbors, modernization efforts, large-scale exercise, and deployment of advanced capabilities along the neighboring countries, a simple posturing, an empty <coughs> bravado. Now we see things differently, and unfortunately, the Zapad 17 exercise only confirmed our concerns. 
it was visible that Russia in a short time period was able to conduct a very well coordinated offensive operation in wide region. Unfortunately, the lack of transparency from the Russian side was not promoting confidence and security in our region. At the same time, we have seen uh, the rise of Daesh, a terrorist organization with territorial aspiration, international network, and state-like a future. At the moment, the coalition is on a track to destroy some of these aspirations. But that doesn't make our people feel totally safe here in Europe. Because of these new challenges, NATO has launched a number of initiatives to cope with new realities. And I would like to stress the very strategic challenges for NATO itself. Trying to look into the crystal ball, which of course I would like to have. I really do think that we have come to the moment where we all world saw the decisions made in Wales and Warsaw Summit are truly significant and they matter. NATO's overall direction with defense and deterrence is correct. An enhanced forward presence initiative is success. It serves as a credible deterrent and it undeniable symbolizes the defensive in nature and the unity of the alliance. Here, I cannot express enough how grateful I am for this allied solidarity. Encouraged by the success of the EFP, it is not any more time for the sleep. We have to look farther and we need to strengthen enhanced forward presence in air and maritime domains as well. We need to endorse the new NATO command structure with agreement and willingness to devote more resources to ensure that it is fit for the purpose. We need to task our logis logisticians to war game different scenarios from logistics point of view and come up with new logistic concept for <coughs> NATO on its own territory. Speaking in more fundamental terms, the need to strengthen the spiritual foundation of NATO is becoming more and more apparent. The unquestionable willingness to stand our own ground in the backbone of any defense. People should understand what NATO is about and that is worth defending. If we cannot convince our people what is at stake, and then we need to defend our community of democracies by all means. Then, strategies, weapons, and defense budget will not help. I'm talking about winning minds and hearts, and we all know that this is what our advisors are targeting in the first place. I think that NATO leaders have to take a serious look on this. In Latvia, we pay special attention to broader engagement of our society in security and defense matters. We have launched several initiatives in this regard concerning changes in a general education system, more options for society involvement in assisting armed forces, and rising defense IQ of our population by giving lectures on defense issues to school pupils, teachers, business people and other groups. As a result, people are more aware and they are more proud about armed forces. For armed forces themselves, increase of defense budget and incoming major equipment gives great boost for soldier morale. All this allows me to state that Latvia can be defended Latvia is defendable and it will be defended 
not matter what. This is a confidence I want to bring to the NATO table, Julie, next year in Brussels. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister. Actually, you proved that uh, those initiatives which were taken uh, during Wales and Warsaw Summit, uh, they are working, and your confidence to a very large extent is the outcome of those NATO decisions commonly agreed by member states. Uh, so let's hope for the next summit will contribute to this confidence in years ahead. Uh, now I would like to turn to uh, Minister Sayan from Canada. So you, also, you were also participating in Riga Conference last year here and at that moment you were just raising your presence here and uh, I think very many people uh, in our country in your country but also in NATO member states were questioning how successful Canadian presence uh, as a lead uh, lead nation of multinational forces will uh, be here so now one year is over uh, and another year is ahead of NATO summit so what would be your uh, menu for for NATO summit next year no, thank you, Ray. It's, it's great to be back uh, here in Riga. Um, it's, uh, I almost feel like at home here. Um, get to uh, discover the wonderful sites. The people are wonderful. Um, and, uh, and to be able to discuss, have uh, thoughtful discussions on the, on, on, the way for, on the way forward, whether it's NATO or our bilateral relationship between our, two, two, between our two nations. But I think to answer the question, what are we looking at for the next summit? What are the type of discussions that we need to have? We need to go back to um, uh, uh, of answer the question of NATO itself. And when we talk about NATO, we talk about uh, we all stand, uh, stand as one. And that's a very important point that we all need to remember. Um, there is a collective will that comes back with, between our own respective nations and the support uh, coming to NATO. And, and, and we in Canada take this responsibility extremely seriously. Uh, hence the reason why we've taken on a significant responsibility as one of the lead nations and very proud to be here uh, leading uh, a battle group here in Latvia. Uh, our uh, frigate that's on a consistent uh, uh, patrol um, uh, with NATO as well, and our air policing uh, th that, that's conducted as currently in, uh, in Romania. So moving forward, it's about um, the, of the, uh, the security challenges that we have faced and how to, how to keep NATO evolving to the various threats. Now we can go back into each nation has its own responsibility to making sure that its own uh, 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 a military uh, political structure um, is 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 effective enough to be able to support the needs uh, of NATO. Um, in Canada, we take that very seriously. We came up with a new defense policy now uh, that puts in the right type of investment, the predictable and sustainable funding that allows us to meet the needs there in Canada, North America, but more importantly, to be engaged in the world. And as one of the priorities that the Prime Minister has set for me as Minister of National Defense is uh, making sure that we enhance our support for NATO. Uh, and to do this is not just about contributions. It's about making sure that uh, the Canadian Armed Forces are flexible enough to be able to meet the needs. And I can assure you that for the next 20 years, we will be able to do this. So the type of discussions we need to move forward is, are we ready for the challenges uh, of, of the future? Are we um, challenges that are in front of us? Have we met the aims uh, today? And this is one of the reasons I've, I make regular trips back here, is to get a first-hand look on how things are going. I'm extremely impressed with the level of leadership between our military leadership the, the political leadership, but more importantly, our women and men in uniform who are actually demonstrating that message of deterrence that we all agreed upon at NATO. Because at the end of the day, these are all words. And it's demonstrated now by our troops on the ground. Like especially in, in the battle group here in Latvia, we have um, a, a quite a few nations, the most amount of nations uh, in any battle group, uh, working together. And people talk about, oh, it's a challenge to work together. I don't consider it a challenge. I, I consider it as an opportunity, an, an opportunity to demonstrate NATO's interoperability, uh, to be able to learn from e each other, be able to take those lessons back and say, what are the things that we can do to, to uh, improve ourselves? 
Now, going into the next year's summit, we need to look at is the command structure um, uh, evolved enough to be able to meet the flexibility uh, for uh, if conflict was to arise? Um, do we have the uh, the right capabilities within NATO to meet those needs. What are, the na what are unique skills within our nations that we can provide, whether it's from cyber, understanding the concept of, uh, uh, of hybrid warfare. I'm actually extremely impressed with what I've been learning about how to deal with fake news and th those type of things um, from here in Latvia and the other uh, uh, the Baltic states. So those are the things that's very important, but for us, uh, when we go to those conversations is when we, as governments, make a decision within NATO moving forward, are we actually meeting the objectives uh, on the ground? Are we having that, sending that strategic message? And we are. Uh, but how do we make sure that we, within the political leadership, continue to support our women and men in, in, in uniform so they can effectively carry out the mission that their governments has put out, and more importantly, NATO has given them. And I can honestly assure you, I think uh, that we are, we need to remain uh, 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 flexible on this, um, because when you have a right message of deterrence, it allows you to uh, um, uh, make sure that there is uh, no uh, unintentional consequences of escalating a situation, because at the end of the day, what we want is transparency and predictability to making sure that uh, uh, we don't escalate any situation, but more importantly, we actually start bringing the temperature down so we can get into a little bit more sustainability and predictability between our nations, because I think we all know we have plenty of security challenges around the world that we should be also focusing on as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, your list uh, of uh, issues to be debated in the next NATO summit is, is long as well, so including such basic principles as interoperability, adaptability, flexibility, capability. But I also wanted uh, to remind this last point which you made, which is of particular importance. It's uh, some kind of uh, responsibility of political leadership in front of military that they both, these both parties, are work in unison and they really can achieve the best goals. So it's an uh, extremely important uh, element. Thank you very much, Minister. So now we've heard two uh, political voices of NATO member states. Uh, now I would like to give floor to Hans Binendijk, who here represents more academic perspective on uh, international security. So Hans, from your perspective, what do you expect from NATO summit next year? Well, academics are trained to give one-hour lectures, so I'll try to avoid that. Um, let me begin by uh, just sort of summarizing uh, 70 years of NATO history in one minute. Uh, we are currently at what I would call NATO 4.0. NATO 1.0 was the Cold War. The main task was collective defense. Na NATO 2.0 was the decade after the Cold War. Uh, the main challenge there, the main task, was cooperative security. NATO 3.0 was the period after 9-11. Uh, and in NATO 3.0, the main focus was crisis management. Uh, we are now in the post-Crimea period, uh, NATO 4.0. And I would argue that the uh, three tasks that have come before, uh, collective defense, cooperative security, and crisis management, Whereas in the past, we focused on one primarily. We have to do all three together now. Uh, we have to do that because of the very complex nature of the challenges that we face. Uh, what, is, what are some of the characteristics of NATO uh, 4.0? I'll just name three of them. Uh, first, the threats, the challenges are extremely complex, ranging from migration to nuclear uh, challenges, new nuclear challenges. Uh, but they're also geographically more dispersed. We now talk about 360 degrees of deterrence and defense. So in the East, we have an adversary who has proven to be extremely agile, in fact, more agile than we are at 29. In the South, we've really underestimated the, the political impact in Europe and in the United States of migration and terrorism. In the North, we haven't really come to terms yet with the high North uh, and what the new challenges will be there. And in the West, you know, we have to think about the fact that the second time that NATO declares an Article 5 might well be a North Korean attack on the United States. Uh, so 
uh, we are living in a, in a very complex uh, world with very complex uh, challenges. The second characteristic uh, is that we have not come to terms with the capabilities that we need uh, to deal with this complex world, and much more has to be done. I'll go back to that in a second. And the third characteristic, and this was raised by the President this morning, uh, has to do with political disunity. Um, I have watched NATO over the decades. We've had this before. Uh, we have had differences over, NATO doc over nuclear doctrine. We've had Vietnam differences over that war. We've had differences over the Iraq war. But to me, this is a little different. Uh, these are not just policy differences. These are differences potentially over values. Uh, the um, rise in nationalism, populism, my state first, my country first. Uh, these are potentially very dangerous trends that can undermine the unity of the alliance. We have to be very careful uh, about managing those trends. So what do we do uh, at the upcoming Brussels summit? Uh, first of all, I'll say that the Wales and Warsaw summits were both very successful. These summits in the past have had a, the effect of pivoting from one of these periods to the other. We saw the Rome-London summits in the early 90s moving us to NATO 2.0. Uh, we saw the Prague summit in particular pivoting us to NATO 3.0. And the, the Wales and Warsaw summits have done the same thing, now pivoting us to NATO 4.0. But much more needs to be done, and it needs to be done in Brussels. So I would say there are four things uh, that we need to think about for Brussels, and some of the other speakers have already touched on many of them. Uh, but the first is we need to enhance deterrence. Uh, we can talk about deterrence at the low end, trying to deter hybrid warfare, very difficult, but I want to focus on deterrence at the high end. Uh, we have moved from, in the past three years, from what you might call existential deterrence uh, before Wales to uh, deterrence by reassurance, which we did at Wales, uh, to deterrence by tripwire, which is what happened at Warsaw, and that has made this part of the world much safer, but we're not there yet. My colleagues at RAND have done studies that say we really have to have deterrence by denial. Uh, politically, I'm not sure that is possible at this point, but I think we can take significant steps in that direction. Uh, we might move towards something that is called uh, deterrence by assured response. I think more can be done in the Baltic states to enhance defense capabilities here. Uh, the so-called BJTF and the NRF, the, rapid, uh, the NATO Rapid uh, uh, Movement uh, Forces, uh, it's uh, under current estimates, even the BJTF is going to take three or four weeks to get here. We need to really focus on them and get, get them much more mobile. National forces are basically not ready, not deployable, not sustainable the way they should be. More needs to be done. Uh, there. Uh, the command structure reform was mentioned. Uh, the command structure was redesigned a couple of years ago based on a very different world. We have to beef it up and make it fit for purpose. Um, we have to uh, recognize that um, we have been fighting uncontested wars, by and large. We are now facing situations where we'll be contested in the NA2AD environment. So we have to work towards that. So these are some of the things I think that will enhance deterrence. That's the first point. Uh, secondly, we need a southern strategy. Uh, we have a word or two words out there, projecting stability, but that's not really a strategy yet. Uh, we have been active in the south, uh, in uh, Afghanistan, in Libya, in Qatar, uh, ISIS operations. Many of those are considered unsuccessful. Uh, or certainly uh, they have problems. And there's a real resistance now to doing more, especially in ground operations in the South. Syria is going to be a total mess, and there's no stomach in NATO to do anything about it. Uh, we've had more success with naval operations, but what we need to figure out so that we have a balanced approach to the alliance, not just enhanced deterrence in the East, but a, a solid Southern strategy, we have to figure out what NATO's lane is in the Southern strategy. What can it really contribute? And it may well be that it, it will be a supporting effort rather than a supported effort. It may well be that these operations will be lead nation, coalition of the willing, and that the role for NATO will be to support all of that. But we need to articulate that. Third, um, 
capabilities and burden sharing. Uh, I think we're on track uh, for the 2%, although uh, many of my German friends say they'll never deliver. Uh, so we have to make sure that they do. In fact, I would like to see uh, at, the, at the next summit a slight acceleration, certainly an agreement on exactly how we're going to get to 2%. And I think that may be in, in the works, but I'd like to see it accelerated. Why not accelerate the, the 2%? by a couple of years, and maybe in exchange for that, the United States can uh, redeploy its fourth uh, brigade combat team back into uh, this part of the world. Um, if we can get to 2%, think about what 2% means. It means an additional $100 billion a year spent by European countries uh, by uh, 2024. We've actually done this before. If you look at defense spending, uh, in the 19, late 1960s through the late 1970s, there was an, in real terms, there was an $80 billion increase in defense spending. And many of the characteristics that caused that to happen uh, in the decade of the 70s are with us again today. So this is not something that is impossible. We need to think about how to spend that money carefully. Uh, many of my European friends in and out of government say, you know, what, are, what should our priorities be? And there's not yet a clear answer. We have priority shortfall lists and all of that, but we really need to focus on how that money should be spent. How should it be spent in such a way that we maintain our interoperability and are able to deal with these. The fourth item, uh, and this is kind of the magic world now, the word now at NATO headquarters. Um, it is a coherence, coherence. We have all of these challenges, we have all of this movement in the alliance, but can we make it all coherent? Uh, and this is what I think people at NATO headquarters are now working towards, uh, and it needs to be done. So how do you get that coherence with uh, all of these problems that we've discussed so far? Well, I'm going to lay on the table the notion that we might need a new strategic concept. I was involved, uh, along with others in this room, in the 2010 strategic concept. That was a very different world. It is high risk to think about doing a new strategic concept. Uh, because of the political disunity issue. But it's also high reward if we can pull it off. And it would create the kind of coherence that is now lacking. So I'm going to just suggest that we ought to think about a new strategic concept, not by Brussels, but initiated at Brussels for maybe a year later. So those would be my four items. Uh, thank you. Another four on top of those which both ministers already mentioned. So it looks that uh, uh, NATO summit's uh, agenda is piling up with more and more different questions. So later on I would like to come back to uh, both ministers and asking uh, what do they consider that NATO member states will not be able to agree upon. But it will be uh, the next round of questions. But now I would like to turn to EU, more EU perspective. Uh, and in in recent uh, months, uh, Europeans were very active putting forward a wide variety of different initiatives and sometimes it reminds me of uh, history coming back and repeating again and again. It's a feeling of deja vu, so political momentums, uh, windows of opportunities, so a lot of wording we've heard before, but nevertheless, if we are looking at those most recent decisions, then EU language with regard to security and defense policy is becoming more and more concrete and going down to the point in terms of 2% of GDP in terms of funding to be allocated for research and development and more and more. So therefore I would like to give floor to another academic, uh, to, to, to Claudia Mayor. So what do you think Claudia, uh, that's what is happening with the EU right now. Are they serious? We are, are we serious about on what we are agreeing upon? Thank you. Th that's a major point. I think it's not are they serious, but are we serious because we are all Europeans or most European member states. Um, maybe just, just before I start on the European dimension, a quick, a quick word on this NATO bid, because my colleagues perfectly sorted out what we need to decide or what we should decide or what we would decide. Maybe we also need to think about what we don't want to address at that very summit. And maybe if you think about what we certainly don't want to address and then work back from there. Maybe just, just some ideas that might sound weird, but sometimes we are better prepared for something which we don't want to have. So how can we actually avoid being told off as Europeans that we haven't 
lived up to the CC's cash commitment and uh, contributions. How could we avoid debates about Turkey being an unpleasant ally? How can we avoid uh, North Korea being a topic? How can we avoid populist governments and allied states questioning NATO? So maybe we should also think about what we don't want to discuss and how we actually can prepare the field for them. But that's just a quick thought about um, how, how to make uh, the summit uh, hopefully success. Coming back to the European or EU defence um, topic, we have indeed currently a kind of European defence momentum, enthusiasm, euphoria, uh, whatever you prefer. And that can actually give additional energy, which is positive and which you need. But it can also bring you to skip some important steps because you are so much into the enthusiasm and you forget about certain things. And I think this is a big, is a big danger. And I think in the moment in the European Union, we forget at least three questions about all that. Um, talk about momentum and window. Do we have a stable basis in the European Union to build a European defense policy on? Do the new tools which are currently discussed in the European Union actually address our problems or do they address something else? And how do we make that momentum which we have certainly in the moment, how do we make it last and make it a success? And I think if you don't address those questions, um, it's likely that the current euphoria will finish like all the other euphorias you mentioned. The famous European summit in 2013 called Defense Matters, didn't matter. Um, the Helsinki headline goals, the battle groups, and all what we had for those who remember. Or the worst example, probably the hour of Europe in 92 or 3. So let me have a few words on those, on those ideas. The first point is the, what I would call the, the weak basis of European defense. We have numerous proposals on the table. CART, Coordinated Annual Review on Defense. PESCO, Permanent Structured Cooperation, so kind of legally binding cooperation. A European defense fund to, to uh, finance research uh, and development. And Macron, two days ago, put another layer on and called for European defense budget intervention force and European doctrine to be developed. That's a lot. That's pretty ambitious, if I might say. But in the same time, I'm not sure we have a really strong basis in Europe to, to develop all that, uh, to put all that uh, together in reality. I think the motivations are pretty different and maybe contradicting. So we have people who are, we have countries who engage in those European cooperation because they're really interested in European integration and keeping the European house together. That's the case mostly of my country, Germany. Other countries are really into developing a credible security and defense force. And other countries just want to join that European defense momentum because they don't want to be left out. Is that a really strong basis to build something on? So I don't think we need agreements within the EU, European Union on all points, but we need at least a little bit of clarity what we want to reach and what that thing should serve for. So I think we need to ask some questions. Can we stay together on that basis? Will European states trust the European Union on defense as they trusted the US and NATO before? Who is going to be the leader in a European defense thingy, in a European defense union? Can we do without a leader? In, the, in NATO we have a clear leader, that's the US. Who is going to be the European leader in a European defense organization? Don't talk about Germany. So who can that be, another country? an EU institution, or can we do without because we are so democratic and so postmodern? Not sure. Is the EU able to foster consensus between its, its member states or not? And to the outside, we need to be clear about what the EU actually wants to achieve. There's talk about European defense. There's talk about strategic autonomy. But what does it actually mean? Do we really want to be autonomous in Europe, but then from whom? And if you don't want to be strategic autonomous, but we only want to do crisis management and stability in the South, then we better make that clear to avoid misunderstandings. How do we relate to the US? Currently, there's no credible defense in, the European, in Europe without the conventional and nuclear capabilities of the US. How do we relate to the UK, who will leave at some point? How do we do without their capabilities and their strategic outlook and their strategic culture? So I think we better make clear what we want and what we don't want in the European Union. I don't think it's very wise in the moment to call for strategic autonomy. I think we better define a realistic goal, what we credibly can do in the European Union and what we can't do. And maybe the EU has a wonderful task to be a defense facilitator, 
supporting capability development, supporting doctrine development, but put it at the service of the single set of forces we have in Europe. So I think defining reasonable goals is an essential and highly responsible task. My second point is about what I call the ambition implementation gap. So far, and I'm deliberately a bit blunt here, is that EU defense cooperation is a nice to have for many states. It's not a necessity. Necessity is what most European states are doing in NATO. That's a real necessity in defense. So we have a cooperation of choice and we have a cooperation of necessity in defense. How can we, deter how can we turn or can we turn EU defense cooperation into a necessity? Can it be something that the Europeans really, really want to do intrinsically? Or does it only come from the outside? The outside pressure reaches from security challenges, Russia, IS, you all know all them, up to Trump. If the, EU, if the US would be serious about rethinking its commitment to Europe, as some academics and some think tankers in the US call for, like Miesheimer, they call for a gradual American withdrawal from NATO accompanied by a progressive transfer of all its functions to Europeans. That would be a strong outside pressure for the Europeans to get their act together. But then we would have European defense by default, not by conviction. And is that strong enough to have a default development? And even if that would happen, would it make Europeans develop defense inside the EU or would we not rather stay within NATO? So the question is, how could we actually bridge the gap between the ambition and the implementation. And so far, we have strong ambition, but we don't have the willingness to implement it. Not politically by saying what we want, not in terms of finances and equipment we make available. You mentioned the, the defense budgets. Many European states are far away from reaching the 2%, very far away, um, and that includes my country. So the old obstacles for making a meaningful defense cooperation are still there. And I'm not sure that the tools we, that have been put in place in the European Union, CART, PESCO, the European Defense Fund, are really the correct answers to that because they seem to be, again, more processes and institutions, but not real output. So that brings me to my, to my last point, which I call managing sovereignty. The current defense momentum is translated so far into institutions, technical details, and processes. But it doesn't address a key political question, and that's the one about sovereignty. I'm very grateful to Macron for having put that issue so high on the agenda on his Sabon speech. He talked about European sovereignty. He clearly recognized, and that's interesting for a French president, he clearly recognized that no country in Europe is able to do anything meaningful in defense on its own. If you want to have sovereignty, that means deciding something and implementing it. We probably need to pull it into a European sovereignty. And if you look about that, and if you look about the current proposals, CART is about gradually synchronizing and adapting national defense planning cycles and capability development. PESCO is about permanently binding countries into structured cooperation. If you look at what Macron suggests, a defense budget, a European intervention force, that's the highest integration level and the highest level of abandoning sovereignty you can probably get. And that's an interesting point. Are the Europeans willing to manage their dependence within the European Union or not? And this is eventually the question that will decide about whether the current proposals will lead to a meaningful result or whether they will finish as all the, the developments and initiatives we had before, literally nothing. So the question is, do European states recognize that they depend on each other and do they recognize and accept to manage their mutual dependence within a EU framework? That's the key political questions. And once we have answered that, we will probably be able to have the processes, institutions, and all that thing done. But that's the key question. Do we accept that our sovereignty is on the European level? 
Thank you, Claudia. It looks that uh, on the one hand there, there is a window of opportunity, but actually a dilemma which frames the development of European security policy is pretty much the same. It's a dilemma between ambition and implementation. So let's see whether finally this dilemma will be solved. So, but despite uh, the fact that we still are living in those two uh, intellectual spaces, not only intellectual but also real spaces, which is more transatlantic, where security depends more on NATO capabilities and European space, which is more like regionally inward looking <clears throat> security space. But again, in recent uh, times, we have noticed that NATO and EU cooperation is on the rise. So again, there were different attempts, but they never resulted in concrete steps and in concrete initiatives. So now we can say that there are those real initiatives and there is a positive some kind of a spin in those relations. Mr. Ali, do you agree that there is potential of EU and NATO cooperation and probably where do you see also troubles in that respect? Yes, thank you. I don't know if I will be able to answer to any of the questions regarding EU, but uh, I think uh, we are uh, in a very good time to speed up the uh, relationship between European Union and NATO. Um, I think that there is a conceptual difference between NATO and uh, European defense, which is uh, NATO is a collective defense system based on the, and every country is committed to defend the individual borders of one country which is attacked by enemies. The ambition of the Euro common European defense system would be to defend common borders. Alcide de Gasperi, 70 years ago, said that the European community of defense would have been the real way to reach a political union in Europe. He died without seeing the project started, and now we are speaking about that uh, since uh, most, more than one year. I think we are on a good way. Federica Mogherini and Jens Stoltenberg are working together. They also have identified some common actions, a plan of 42 common actions. Uh, of course, my feeling is that we have NATO today. NATO is not coincident with the European Union, but uh, overlapping very, uh, very well. 22 European countries are also members of NATO, and others are partners. We must start from NATO. Of course, uh, we must build synergies, avoid duplications, as we always say. It's not easy, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a path. Uh, the Latins uh, said, uh, natura non facit saltus, which means nature don't make jumps. So we, we must, we must uh, have the courage of uh, um, going progressively towards uh, our uh, goals. Uh, I think that uh, um, Europe, European Union and NATO have common uh, interests, are facing common threats, and probably they have also common priorities. Let's see just two or three examples. And uh, I want to, to, to say that this is a, a political issue, in my opinion. Eastern flank for um, uh, the alliance and the eastern uh, partnership for European Union. I think we have the same goal. Uh, NATO says project stability outside. We have on the other side the uh, Russian Federation, which wants to project instability towards us and other parts of the world. So this is a common challenge. South, we have to face common challenges as well. Terrorism, migration, and security coming from the South. Now NATO has established the hub for South in the, base, uh, in the NATO base in Naples. That's a very important political uh, signal that NATO is taking care of the southern flank as well. Uh, of course, uh, European Union is committed to, must be committed to the southern flank because of migration and refugee crisis as well. Burden sharing. The 2% goal is a NATO goal, 
is not a European Union goal, but countries in Europe understand that we must spend more and we must spend better. What the European Union is trying to, to say, we have to have a more rational approach to the expenses. We have uh, in uh, Europe uh, something like 140 different uh, systems of armament, while in the United States they have 24, 25. So uh, make synergies, interoperability, and so on. This is, uh, how to say, two parallel paths. The first one is spend more, and the second one is spend better. And I think that we also should measure the real outcomes in terms of collective defense, because there are countries spending more than 2%, but not giving significant contribution to the collective defense. There are countries which spend less than 2%, but they are more, much more active on the field of collective defense. Uh, this is also a politically mm, difficult point because, I make an example, what would the world think uh, of Germany doubling their investments from 37 billion euro to 75? Rearmament of Germany, how could be perceived, perceived by the international community? So we must go towards the, that uh, goal, but we need to take into consideration also political and uh, impact, and also impact on public opinion. Uh, I would like to make another example, if I, if I may, of how, in my opinion, European Union and uh, NATO must cooperate strictly together, which is the Western Balkans. I visited the Western Balkans uh, in the last month, all the states. The situation there is we, we underestimate the threats coming from the Western Balkans. We have uh, Slovenia and Croatia, members of you. European Union and NATO, Albania and Montenegro now are members of NATO and not of the European Union, but Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Kosovo and Macedonia are really critical situations. Bosnia, Herzegovina is blocked by this trilateral management of the power coming from the Dayton agreements. This is giving favor to who? To external actors. Turkey before, and now Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is investing a lot of money in Bosnia and Herzegovina, supporting the Islamic component, and so increasing dramatically the risk of Islamic radicalization inside Europe, because the Western Balkans are not 4,000 miles away. They are inside Europe. So I think that the European Union and NATO must work together to speed up the process of euro atlantic integration in the Western Balkans. This is an example. I think this must be a priority also of the next uh, summit. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now before giving floor to the audience uh, to ask questions to our distinguished panelists, I would like to ask uh, two questions. One I would like to address to Claudia. So, uh, having in mind uh, some kind of uh, hypothetical situation that EU really succeeds in its ambitions, at least a little bit goes ahead, uh, who would lead EU's defense? I think actually it depends on, on what the success of EU defense would mean. As I understand it in the moment, that would really be strengthening the capabilities for crisis management in the South on the one hand. And on the other hand, trying to coordinate the rising defense budgets and strengthening the defense industrial basis. For the second one, you don't need a lead country. A lead country. Mm -hmm. And for the first one, I think it would be case by case. But that's the weak point of the whole picture. Um, because there's no, in my opinion, no clear leader, natural leader that all other countries would respect. So we don't have the hegemon we have in NATO with the US who is respected, um, or at least the countries listen to him. So I think that's, that's a, major, a major weak point of the European defense.
Melinda. Okay, thank you. And then I would like to actually um, uh, pass uh, Hans' question about not agreeing on to both ministers. What do you think? Which issues within the NATO right now could cause uh, trouble with the NATO? So under what circumstances coherence of NATO could be undermined? What countries cannot agree upon right now? Well, we, we agree all the time. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, the, uh, um, I, I think when you, when you have that many nations coming together, obviously you're going to have dis dis disagreements on various issues. Um, but, but more importantly, do you have the ability to work, th work through some, some of the challenges? Um, since uh, I became Minister of Defense and um, representing Canada at, at, at the table, what I saw were you know, different conversations um, uh, from when you look at Europe, um, as we talked about the, the concerns, um, the concerns in this part uh, of Europe, the South, and those challenges. And what we, what I thought was, okay, we needed to have a discussion to making sure that NATO can be flexible enough to respond to the various needs. And I think we're moving towards that path because we do have those challenges and everybody has a legitimate concern. Um, but then there's, do we prioritize uh, some of that work? So that's, so there, yeah, there is sometimes I would say uh, uh, good conversations on um, where do we need to put the focus. Uh, we in Canada can, uh, um, my recommendation to the Prime Minister is always is not just look at jumping into something just because everybody else is doing it. Look at where Canada can provide. My recommendations um, always uh, are about where do, where do we, if Canada can provide certain skills, we can provide that level of support. Hence the reason why we added air policing into, um, uh, into our support at NATO, because we do have some very good skills that we can offer up. Uh, when we took on the leadership here in, um, as one of the advanced or presence battle groups, is because we felt that we had the leadership to provide that level of uh, support. So I think what we need to be able to do is when we have those disagreements regarding where do we need to put resources is then look at how do we uh, come up with a solution that will meet the needs. And it all comes down to where are the, where are the concerns, where are the threats, um, because we all, because we all do need to at the end of the day uh, uh, work together. Um, so it's working through some of those challenges, but ultimately we will have disagreements and nations will need to bring that up. That is the beauty of NATO, coming together. And, uh, but, but one thing I think we should, regardless of the disagreements that we might have, NATO does stand as one. We do have the co collective will. Um, we talk about our budgets. Um, yes, we as nations need to look at our defense, but our budgets are also collective as well when you put, when you do things, when you put things together. We in Canada, um, when, when I get looked upon as what are we doing in terms of NATO 2%, well, we just put our new defense policy. We're increasing uh, our defense spending by 70%, over 70% by 2026. We will up, be up at 33 billion. Currently, we're at about 19 billion. Uh, but at the same time, I have to make sure that we have all the necessary resources in Canada to respond for the needs of Canadians, which is uh, the, 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 the floods in Quebec, uh, the forest fires in BC. We have uh, uh, the hurricanes that we're supporting with the US and, and the Caribbean, not to mention North American defense and the Asia Pacific as well, while at the same time doing our responsibility here at NATO. Um, so when we have those disagreements, we as nations as well have to be able to understand each other's uh, constraints um, but we, one thing, when you put it all together, I have been impressed with was when a decision is made, uh, for example, just one with e EFP alone, we made a decision, uh, in Warsaw our leaders uh, announced it, we have now within one year have four interoperable battle groups that are at full operational capabilities and that really demonstrates the resolve of NATO to move forward. Thank you. Mr. Bergman, what oh, kind of disagreements? Yeah, there was, there was a full coverage of both the healthier problems uh, for Hajit. And uh, when I listen to my colleagues on the panels, uh, I think it's a very easy answer for this uh, question. Look at uh, how, far, uh, how quick uh, NATO adapted after 2014. Wells decision, summit decision, Warsaw decision. And I was yesterday together with my uh, colleagues in ADG base, in our main uh, land forces base in, in Latvia. 
I can't believe it which way we are adapted and how quick we are found the right solution. Thank you very much for Canadians and for every nation who are involved in this process. And uh, yeah, listen, ambition and implementations. Uh, but if you don't have ambitions, uh, you can know where is your future. Uh, leaderships, absolutely. I am uh, agree that, and uh, I saw every minister of NATO, minister ministerially, uh, attempts and show leaderships how we are cooperated. And uh, I talked today morning with my counterpart, Hajit, and we are so at a lot of uh, directions where we work together. And of course, that is important uh, for NATO. But what's uh, Ali, uh, NATO in 29 countries, uh, 22 countries is the same in EU. And if we are, I absolutely agree what say uh, Ali, uh, if we are works together and goes together, we are much faster to take that's our goals and ambitions. And, uh, and uh, like about the borders, yeah, it's our common borders, and why Canadians is here, because it's our NATO borders. And thank you very much for your uh, support. Thank you. And now it's time for questions. I immediately see uh, the Western flank uh, raising their hands. So probably again we could stick to a geographical kind of uh, order and we could start from this side and then we'll go to that side as well. So where is the microphone? Please, here is uh, General Whitman and then Julianne, it will be yours. Hi. Um, I'm uh, General Klaus Whitman, Aspen Institute, Germany and University of Potsdam. In the German election campaign, I publicly attacked some of the social democratic politicians who discredited the 2% commitment as Trump pressure, whilst uh, as part of the government they had been part of the decisions uh, in Wales and Warsaw, as well as they uh, supported the increase in defense spending taking place in Germany, they supported the uh, assumption of greater responsibility of Germany. And I said, all this is not rearmament or arms race. It is for uh, the coming years mainly the undoing of the deficits that we had allowed to occur during two hopeful decades. On the other hand, I find the systematic of the 2% not very convincing. It is totally input-oriented. It says nothing about capabilities and priorities. You could fulfill it even by raising the pensions of the generals. And uh, would I, would like, I would like to see the 2018 summit administer or task uh, the development of a more uh, intelligent methodology that would also include some of the uh, uh, um, national efforts and contributions that go beyond the military uh, aspects. And uh, I would value your opinion about that. Secondly, one little remark to what Hans said about the strategic concept. In 2007, I was among those who wrote the first articles about the need for a new strategic concept having contributed to the first and the second one. And when people said, oh, 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 this will be a very divisive exercise, then I used to answer, are we not so divided on many accounts that we now should start a uniting effort? I must admit, with the present American administration, I am hesitant to risk unraveling what we have. And I would ask you uh, uh, for your reaction. Thank you. We will collect more questions and then uh, panelists will answer. So, Julian, now it's your turn. Thank you, Zanetta. Julian Lindley, French Minister. Nice to see you. Um, I sometimes wonder if the purpose of these days for NATO is to simply prepare successful summit declarations. Um, yes, the summits have been useful. But when I think about standing in this great city some 10 years ago, asking questions about what NATO needs to be credible in its deterrence and defense posture, 
And here I am, 10 years on, hearing to the same kind of slogans, money, more money, better spent, standing together as one. Then I look at the quality of the 400,000 or so troops a few kilometers from here on the other side of the Russian border. Let me ask you all a blunt question, because I think we're in trouble. What is the critical lacunae, the critical shortfall that NATO needs from its members now to strengthen deterrence and defense, to strengthen the enhanced forward posture. Because if we go on as we are, as we see the change that we're facing move progressively away from our ability to cope with it, I'm not sure we've got many more years where we can have comforting conversations about institutional reform. We need more capabilities and more capacity right now and right here. Thank you. Thank you. And now we can take two questions over there. It's Artis Lange. Let's start on the next. Yeah, Artis Lange, uh, Latvian Parliament, European Affairs Committee. Um, well, uh, the question is, the question was raised, what will people say if, if Germany raises its defense spending? There's a war going on in Europe. Russia has attacked Ukraine. 10,000 people are dead. Russia broke down the international order. It did it also, by the way, in Georgia, you know. And we're worried about what people will say. I think it's time for us to allow Germany to be normal again, okay? A democratic state and allow it to increase its defense expenditure because that is not the issue. The issue is what Russia is doing. Thank you. Thank you. And then lady next to you, yeah. Uh, thank you, Agla Moroskaita, University of Maryland. I have two very quick questions. Uh, one is something that Janet Ozolina sort of raised, uh, the NATO-EU cooperation agreement signed in Warsaw. Uh, one year from now in Brussels, what is it that we will have to show for it? If each panelist could just name one thing that strikes them that has actually concretely been achieved. Because nationally what we see is it caused uh, quite a budgetary tug of war in the tensions to fill the 2% defense spending and at the same time the all sorts of national welfare programs, education initiatives and whatnot. So what has been achieved and what can we do uh, collectively to sort of reframe long-term security discourse to be more inclusive of things like welfare, social, uh, social initiatives that really are the long, hard process, not so much militarized, but that will guarantee our collective security as a society. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I would declare that the first round of questions is closed, but we will come back to the next round. And now I will pass the floor to our panelists to respond. Hans, probably we would start with you. Okay. Um, first uh, to Klaus, thank you for your um, question on 2%. And I'm glad you took the position that you did. 2% is what we call in the United States a two by four. That is the big stick that you use to wake people up. Uh, and that's, and it worked, but it's certainly not the answer. And I agree with you, outputs are critical. Uh, so what are the, Julian asks, what are the outputs uh, that uh, we're looking for? Uh, I would say two things. Uh, the first is the ability uh, to be to, uh, increased readiness, the ability to de deploy and sustain force movements quickly. That really enhances deterrence. And secondly, Europe needs to be able to uh, help the United States uh, much more significantly than it can now with uh, eight, what we call anti-A2AD operations. Um, so those are, the, I would, if you want two, those are the two places that I would, I would put some emphasis on. Um, Klaus, you also asked about the strategic concept. Uh, I said in my opening remarks that it is high risk, high payoff. Uh, I'm not sure I would recommend it right now. On the other hand, if the Trump administration uh, wants to do something like this, and uh, he would uh, be able to use the strategic concept to take ownership uh, and really change his mind about the alliance, then it's a good thing. But I, I agree with you, there are risks. Just on, finally, on the last question about NATO-EU, um, it's not clear a year from now exactly what we'll be able to point to, but I can say this. Uh, I, th I have seen a tremendous improvement at the grassroots level. 
in the ability of NATO officials and EU officials to deal with each other. That's been happening over the last year or so. Um, the last summit um, uh, laid down some uh, very important uh, uh, groundwork to do more of that. So what the specific EU will be, it's not clear to me yet, possibly some division of labor uh, as well. But we're moving in the right direction on that front. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, a quick point on the 2%. I mean, I think we all agree that's a totally arbitrary and not useful goal at all. Um, but it has a beauty to be understood by everyone. And that's a big advantage. So if you want to communicate about defense, and if we want our publics to understand something about defense, the 2% goal with all its problems, input, output, I totally agree on that. It has an advantage. Um, in view of making it a bit more useful, we have the three C's inside NATO. So cash, capability, and commitment. So it's already, there are already efforts uh, to measure a bit better what countries do. And the countries who spend it on unuseful capabilities or pensions usually exactly know that they're doing stupid things. So um, I think there's a certain beauty in the 2% goal with all criticism. Um, Germany, German's defense budget is getting up, is rising. It's rising slowly. But one also has to remind, uh, has to remember that the German economy is rather doing well. So getting 2% is actually not an easy task if you have economy which is doing well. We could just run down the economy, we would get the 2% very quickly, but that's not something um, somebody would call for. So I would be cautiously optimistic about the German defense budget, but I think if I, another point on the German commitment is if you look back over the last four years, German defense policy has changed considerably. Germany has not been very loud about it, but if you look in the facts, there is indeed a major change about Germany behaves on the national scene and secure defense issues. Um, look to NATO. Germany is an EFP nation, uh, was one of the biggest troop contributors in the East. Um, Germany considerably shaped, not everybody liked it, but considerably shaped um, the Warsaw and the Wales summit direction not only in the military realm, but also in the political and diplomatic realm, with being very present, Minsk, Normandy, OCE, and EU, when it comes to Russia. In the capability realm, with the framework nation concept, Germany was a country to suggest a systematic way of organizing defense cooperation in Europe. So you have a changed security and defense policy of Germany, and my impression is that it's actually accepted. And that reminds me of the famous Sikorsky quote, um, that he fears a weak Germany more than a strong Germany. A last point, and I deliberately make that point because I think it's useful to get out of the hectic imperialism we have here and look more into the long-term perspective. Um, and this kind of brings the various questions together, but I think it's, it's useful to kind of stay for a moment and just look a bit beyond. If you, look, if you talk about European defense, it's definitely crucial, essential, and everything you want to keep the US in. And it's clear that the Europeans should become stronger, and we should understand that the 2% is not a present to Trump, but something we Europeans need. So we need stronger European defense. Not because the Americans want it, but because we need it and be convinced that defense matters. But also, we should be very honest and serious and think about what's going to happen if the US, whoever will be the president, for whatever reason, decides to change its focus to another region or to another task and setting different priorities. That might happen even if you don't want that. So how do we actually, how do we prepare for such a moment? How do we actually prepare for being more self-confident and capable in European defense while keeping the Americans in? How to make the most of the current defense investment? For what scenario do we prepare? How we can spend better? How can we make the most of the EU tools, industry, for example. So I think we should think more on the long-term dimension. How do we Europeans prepare for one day where we might be more lonely than actually we want to do that, or we dream or we actually intend to do that? 
in the conventional area, in the political area, and in the nuclear area. And we haven't touched upon the nuclear question here. That's the odd one out. So how do we prepare for all that? Thank you. Uh, ministers, would you like to respond to questions? Uh, just a short answer, about 2%. And uh, I think uh, I heard in uh, Munich uh, security conference when Councillor Merkel says she talked about 3%, but connecting with as other programs, not just in military programs. And, uh, but uh, about our country's 2%, uh, this is uh, our commitment and uh, for our obligations, uh, what we are agreeing in Welsh summit. And uh, that is the importance, not just if we look uh, for broader uh, pictures, but if I say that example, if, if each link of NATO is strong, NATO is much stronger. And uh, that is our obligations. And we are a lot of talk about uh, uh, Washington Treaty fifth articles, but don't forget of article number three. This is our obligations, and that's how I see. Of course, it's important which way we are spending, it's 2%. But now we have an absolutely clear, uh, clear way, our priorities, and we are spent this way. And thank you very much, because it's a huge, uh, uh, in, invest uh, a huge money and resources from our allies in here. We saw yesterday in our ma main base how big is this invest, and that's helped for us, and that's stronger, strengthens than not just us, but things uh, are peaceful in this region. Thank you. Uh, just, just very quickly, I'll say um, uh, credible capabilities is what's needed. We, uh, we need to make sure that we as nations have the right capabilities that can meet the needs of the future um, so that we can anticipate. Last thing you want to be able to do is you can't, you don't predict a, uh, uh, a situa situation I'd rather have the tools to be able to understand that something is come, uh, rising and use a diplomatic approach to resolve it beforehand that the so that you don't have to send military troops into harm's way. That's what we need to do. So it can't be strictly a military look at things. Having said that, we do need to uh, uh, invest in defense as nations. And I think um, uh, there's been some very strong, credible conversations regarding this, and it's happening. But we need to invest in credible capabilities. I'll give you an example. We took this to heart. Um, I have uh, 1.6 billion dollars as part of the defense policy in the next 20 years to, for research and development, to look at the needs in, way into the future. And that's going to be needed because um, I can't uh, just settle for, as, uh, from the political leadership side of things, look at the current conflict now and be ready for it and miss the next one. Otherwise, we're just going to be just dealing with conflict after conflict. We need to get into de-escalating conflicts because I can't go back to we have significant challenges in the world. We can't, look, can't also forget about the, the environment. We have, we're spending a uh, significant amount of resources to respond to the needs of populations around the world because of natural disasters. Um, so we have other challenges that we need to face. More, the, the better we get at this from credible capabilities, the better we get at deterrence, um, uh, then we'll have a better chance of having uh, peaceful resolutions to conflict. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Ali? Well, um, just a remark which is not responding to, directly to the questions, but it was, came to my mind um, uh, also when you asked before where, where are the threats from, from inside. Um, I think that we are facing a very difficult situation with, with what we call populism. Um, I'm a member of a parliament. At the end of the day, I have to press a button to approve uh, some laws, okay? And probably I also live in a country where populism is very strong, Italy. Well, what do populists say? regarding increasing the budget for defense, you are wasting money. They don't understand or they don't want to understand that investments for security is investment for our future. They say Italy first, France first, maybe America first, uh, which means 
isolation, no cooperation. Uh, you know what happened when we voted in the Italian Parliament uh, to the authorization to the mission? Yesterday we saw we have 160 soldiers here. Well, the titles on the newspaper the day after our vote was Italy is going to declare war to Russia. This is populism, which is amplified by the media. We have to, to take into consideration this. There are countries in which this is not so strong, but other countries in, in, this, in which this is very strong. Populist parties in Europe are all pro-Russian. Why? Because they say uh, Putin is a very strong leader and he defends the interests of his country. We must do the same. Then we have also the fact that Putin pays money, but that, that's another story. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the example of Germany, Germany uh, doubling the investments is more than welcome, of course. But the perception, I, I made the example, because we, we must be careful in not feeding a wrong perception of, of what is happening because today we have a big portion of the public opinion which is against everything and which is ready to use any decision we take to uh, use it against us, against, because this is anti-system forces. And unfortunately, I think it's not happening only on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. Thank you very much. Now it's time for the second round of questions, so I would like to see hands rising. So it's uh, here, two, three, four. This time the western flank is quiet, so we can go this way. Uh, hello, uh, this is Shota Guineria, NSC of Georgia. Uh, my question goes uh, for the Black Sea security. Uh, and if we look at the Black Sea security uh, from the Eagle Eye perspective, there are three NATO member states, two special partners, and Russia, which is putting threat to all five. Uh, and uh, at the Warsaw Summit, NATO announced that there will be a tailored forward presence to strengthen the Black Sea security. So how does it look from the NATO's perspective? Is it only about the security of its members? or uh, it will include also the uh, partners, because Russia has been trying to uh, draw division lines in Europe, in the Black Sea, starting from Georgia, 08, and continued in Ukraine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, over there. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Yuri Anishenko. I'm a journalist from Ukraine, and my question about enlargement of NATO. Uh, NATO officially recognized uh, three aspiring members, Bosnia, Macedonia and Georgia. Uh, meanwhile, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's parliament two months ago passed a law uh, that making uh, integration with NATO our priority of foreign policy. So my question, uh, does NATO um, uh, think about possibility to uh, include Ukraine in the list of aspiring members countries. Thank you. Thank you. And one, one more hand here. So, just... Yeah. I'm Kartik Desai, Chairman of the Board, Sia Baltovens. My question is on uh, terrorism. So, terrorism, it's not a mere uh, issue of radicalism, but it's a proxy war. And that's happening on the very soil of Europe nowadays. So how do you perceive the security and the defensive measures, more so the role of NATO in countering such uh, uh, terrorism? Thank you. And please be so kind. Pause the microphone here in the middle of uh, the audience. This would be the last question. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Amish. I'm from Portugal. Uh, my question goes directly to Mr. Uh, Sajan. Um, 
what Dr. Claude said uh, about the lack of leading uh, leadership in the, in the EU and uh, uh, in the EU common policy. Uh, we've seen the last week um, a front, uh, front cape of the, the Economist uh, where Macron was speaking and the, the lights were on him and Merkel was on the shadows. Uh, we also know the, 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 the famous quote from Kissinger, uh, he doesn't know who to call to Europe. Now, uh, after Trump, uh, some of the European countries see Canada as a, a leading role and as the moderator in the beginning said, Canada can might take the lead. My question with a touch of provoca uh, provocative uh, is Canadian soft power still patient to uh, handle with this EU mess? Till how far Canada will handle this thing of who, do I, who should I call to Europe? Thank you. Thanks for the easy question. <laughs> Artists suggest to call Latvia. <laughs> I would support it. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, and now I see four big issues. It's Black Sea, uh, NATO enlargement, Ukraine, terrorism, and uh, Canadian soft power to deal with the European mess. So probably we could start with Black Sea. Who would like to take this question? Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, of course, uh, we are so... And uh, Black Sea is similar situation like in uh, in the uh, Baltic region uh, because uh, we know and we saw that some elements uh, in uh, last exercise in Zapad 17th, <coughs> A2AD, and Russia looking with that direction. And of course, enhanced forward presence uh, in Romania is a similar uh, answer like in, in our, kind of our soils here. Uh, of course, it's a much different uh, situation because we were mentioned three nations uh, of uh, NATO, Turkish, Romania, and Bel uh, Bulgaria. And of course, frozen, uh, I think uh, a lot of frozen uh, conflicts. We use always uh, a, a Russia when if I give opportunities like Abkhazia, like in uh, Crimea, like in, in Moldova, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and others. And Russia uses that always if we are show, whereas something uh, weak point, tactically it's very easy. But uh, how we see, its answer is very well. And I saw uh, what I say, what we do here is a great answer for, uh, and I think we do the same in, uh, in uh, Black Sea region. Uh, but of course, uh, if we back on 2% uh, spending, uh, Romania, I think, is the sixth uh, member who is, uh, takes this uh, uh, bar. And next year we are in Lithuania and the same club and 2%. But, uh, of course, if we are see that process together with migrations, uh, fluid, terrorism, that's not an easy answer for you. And, uh, but uh, we move forward, and each of our ministers in NATO, we talk about that. So don't see just about, and don't talk about one region, west, west, uh, west uh, side or, or uh, south side, or, but approach of 360 degrees. Thank you. Hans, you wanted to also to say something on that. Yes, on the Black Sea. Um, if one looks at the progress that has been made uh, in the Baltic Sea region over the last couple of years, we have really enhanced security here. More to do, but we've done it. The Black Sea, I'm not sure you can say exactly the same thing. Uh, in fact, uh, the annexation of Crimea gave Russia a real strong position in the Black Sea, stronger than it had before. Uh, and you have three nations uh, in the northern part of the Black Sea, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, uh, all of whom essentially are occupied, or parts of them are occupied with Russian forces. Uh, they are not, I don't think, going to be members of the alliance uh, in the near future. We need to do more to strengthen all three of these countries. And then you have the complication, the naval issue, uh, the Montrose Convention, which sort of limits what we can do in terms of naval power in the Black Sea. So if you compare the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea and where we are in these two areas, we have a lot more to do in the Black Sea. Thank you. Uh, so Ukraine, uh, NATO enlargement. 
Oh. Okay, Claudia, you will solve finally this issue. <laughs> I can. I have the. I have the advantage of not being an official, so I can be very blunt, and I don't have to refer to official protocols or things like that. So I might. I might. I might answer with a question, and my question would be: Do you think? that an alliance that can't agree to deliver weapons to Ukraine would include it in an alliance which has an Article 5? I think the answer is pretty clear. Uh, thank you. Then there was a question uh, uh, to Minister Sayan on Canadian soft power to deal with European mess. And probably you could also elaborate on terrorism. Sure. Um Within the, well, I won't answer the question in the same context it was asked, because uh, I don't think uh, Europe's in, in a mess. Um, the, I mean, Canada will always do its part. Uh, our government is committed to this, and we, we have outlined it in our defense policy quite clearly. In fact, actually, in the, our title of our defense policy is Strong in Canada. And by the way, sir, it's based on Strong in Canada means capabilities, what it means to be Strong in Canada secure in North America and the capabilities required for that and engage in the world. We actually went through our own assessment of the number of troops that we can actually uh, deploy on various missions, what capabilities are required around it, and more importantly, what does it cost to maintain that? And we have done that. So when it comes to um, uh, the Canadian uh, contribution, whether you want to call it soft power or Canadian influence uh, because of uh, um, uh, we as a nation, obviously, I think we can put hand on heart to say don't have a lot of baggage, uh, um, uh, you know, as a, other uh, nations have ha has had historically. Uh, one thing before we actually go into what Canada can do, let's not also rule out about what the U.S., the, I understand that there is, you know, what we sometimes hear in the media uh, about the U.S. and it goes down a certain path. Um, Secretary Mattis, I've had a number of conversations with him, and one, the U.S. is committed to NATO, uh, the direct reassurance uh, from them. They've actually demonstrated it uh, tangibly uh, as well. They're playing a significant role on various conflicts uh, around the world, uh, and Canada will be a, be a part um, of that. And so. When it comes to, when we look at Europe, we just don't look at if from we're helping a NATO or we're helping Europe. This is about looking at um, uh, doing our part to prevent conflict in other parts or reducing it. Because, I don't know who phrased it, uh, it said you can't be an island of stability in, in an ocean of turmoil. If we start looking, every nation starts looking internally uh, at, hey, we're strong and let's look after ourselves, well, guess what? Well, then don't start complaining when some uh, terrorist act comes, comes to your doors. So we do need to do our part. We need to look at parts where, uh, um, uh, look at the various challenges that we're facing, whether, it's, whether we're talking about North Korea now, uh, or the conflict uh, in Ukraine, or the direct uh, radicalization of certain groups and the, and the growth of, of terrorism. It is a very complex world, and we all need to kind of balance ourselves where, uh, which, where each nation kind of fits in. But to answer your question directly, yeah, Canada will do its part, but we want to be constructive um, in this. E Europe has already has tremendous potential, and they will go through that. We'll provide our, our, our support. Um, talking about Germany, I'm very proud of the work that, actually, that Germany actually has demonstrated, um, not only in Europe as part of uh, NATO, but also internationally as well, from peacekeeping operations where we in Canada can learn from them, the work that they're doing um, uh, in Iraq uh, a a as well. Um, and the final thing about, I'll talk about when it comes to uh, terrorism, and I'll get back to one final point about Ukraine as well. We need to start looking about the root cause of problems. Uh, we've, we have to ask ourselves, why, why has there been a, a, a rise of terrorism, right? How is it that uh, these, these groups, um, like groups like Daesh, are able to recruit uh, young, impressionable youth from around the world to get them to do atro atrocious things? And we need to start addressing that and as having those difficult conversations. Otherwise, uh, what, having a conversation strictly about waiting for an action, a horrible action to happen, then figuring out what a response is, well, is that really responsible? Right? We need to, as nations, get better at 
uh, predicting some of these things, looking at what are, the, what, are the, what are the early signs? How can you intervene early? Was our development work in Africa, uh, as we, uh, we in, in Canada had started to reduce that? And there's been a rise of, of radicalization in Africa. Look at just the African youth bulge right now. If you want to look at some potential future problems that might arise, what if the uh, disproportion of the wealthy and the poor, can, that, that, that gap gets worse? And these radical groups will come in and will come in and say, no one else is helping you, we will. And it's a similar theme. Whether you want to talk about the Taliban, whether you want to talk about ISIS, Al-Qaeda, they look at grievances. Our development work was helping. We need to look at reducing some of these uh, issues. Otherwise, we all come to the rescue at the last minute with our troops, put our troops into harm's way, spend a lot of money. Well, wouldn't it be better if we actually looked at the root cause of various problems? And the terrorism aspect of things is going to have to be dealt with a number of ways. First of all, we're going to have to fight it directly. When you allow a situation to get so, so bad, you have to fight it, which we are. Then we need to figure out and answer the question about the root cause and look at how do you prevent these youth from being recruited into these organizations. The Taliban ended up paying people to fight for them. We know this. What do you think Al-Qaeda was doing? It's not just this great cause that they're jumping to, um, to fight for. They're actually paying and providing resources for these people. They're giving them a future. Where they didn't have significance in life, all of a sudden they're getting it. So these are some of the challenges that we also face. I'm sorry, kind of expanding uh, the answer here a little bit. We need to be able to look at the root cause. And also, we need to, when we look at the Ukraine, we need to stand up. Even though Ukraine might not, might, may not be a part of NATO, we need to stand up for the Ukraine. To be able to say, you can, a nation cannot just irresponsibly come and jump in uh, to a border just because they have a concern that uh, a nation might join NATO. Right? So we need to work together, and at the same time, we do need to be responsible in our response as well so that we don't send a message that actually escalates the situation. And I'll go back to NATO's, yes, we stand as one, and the reason why we need to, when any plans that we have, we need to be transparent with it and we need to be predictable so that it doesn't start an escalation uh, further. A uh, lot of work that needs to be done uh, with this, a lot of challenges, but I'm actually um, very proud to have great colleagues to be able to work on this, and we have great military leadership to help us with that problem. Thank you, Minister Badwinswell. And if I a little bit add uh, about Canada soft power, uh, Canada is a very strong soft power, uh, and I think it's the strongest uh, soft power nation through ice hockey. It's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and a big impact on Europe. Uh, <laughs> oh, we're gonna, uh, and we can kick ass as well. Don't ever forget that, okay? <laughs> we did that in Afghanistan. Would you like to have some final comments? Um, just a word on, about terrorism. I fully agree with the minister here. But uh, just to say that, um, uh, yes, terrorism is, is a proxy, proxy war. It's not uh, only uh, radicalism. But uh, I think that we have clear demonstration that uh, the origin of Islamist terrorism is in the war inside the Islamic world between Sunnis and Shias. And uh, the um, coming up of Iran to the, international, to the attention of the international community after the nuclear deal is increasing the tensions in the region. Iran is trying to, to circumvent Saudi Arabia with, uh, based on uh, alliances in Iraq and with Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia is reacting feeding again a, a terrorist organization in ir Iraq, again, Syria and Iraq against the, the, uh, the, the Shias in, uh, in, in Iraq and in Iran. So, uh, and uh, other reaction, Saudi Arabia is making war to Yemen because Yemen is led now by a Shiite component. So uh, it's clear that the first answer to the terrorism must, be, must come from the, Islamic, from the Islamic world, because it's mainly connected to in, internal issues, and then, of course, NATO can do a lot in terms of prevention, reaction. The operation in Afghanistan was uh, like that. But uh, we cannot think to answer uh, to the problem of terrorism without the cooperation of the Islamic world. And uh, my last comment, just a few words. I think that NATO and the European Union should also look 
East, but not only East, also Far East, because China will be a problem in the next uh, times. And North, they are high North, I think those would be issues also for the next uh, NATO summit. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, if I am allowed to wrap up our sessions, there are a few keywords which immediately rings a bell when it comes to next summit uh, uh, in Brussels next year. So it looks that NATO will still look 360 around the world and what you all gentlemen and lady mentioned here, uh, deterrence still will be the key word on the way to summit and as Hans mentioned, enhanced deterrence uh, should be put at place as well as defense spending but uh, it's not only a matter of 2%, 2.1 or 2.3%, it's uh, very much about efficiency of defense spending as well as flexibility and it looks that military is very flexible but uh, the problem is with politicians to be flexible enough to react to urgent needs of, of societies. And uh, my final note will be a quote from uh, Claudia, where you mentioned that when it comes to EU, but it's not only EU, three things are important, cash, capability, and commitment. And I hope that the next summit will prove it. So I would invite audience uh, to join me in uh, applause, uh, thanking our panelists. Thank you very much.